Remember when we told you that reading through a thousand examples of successful essays was a bad idea, destined to cloud your brain and induce the panic we just spent 20 minutes teaching you how to dispel? We still stand by our story. That said, the interweb is a candy store full of college essay examples, and even we have been tempted to indulge from time to time. Also, taking a peek at a handful of admissions essays written by real students, and not cats, will help solidify the advice we have been dispensing over the course of this series, which is why we've chosen to share excerpts from some of our favorite college essays over the years. Remember, these essays showcase some effective strategies and tools that can be implemented in your own college essays, but you also have ideas that no one else in the history of college essay writing has used before. So use these examples as a guide and a launch point, not as a limitation. Over the course of this series, we have often talked about the short summary phrase that admissions officers will use to define you, the one that they will mention to recall the glory of your essay to others when decision time comes. While we weren't around the decision tables when the following essays determine their writers' fates, there are certain things we imagine admissions officers exclaiming while holding them up and saying, take her. Forget the students' names. These images and descriptions are what likely burn themselves into admissions officers' brains. And they're how we will refer to each student as we take a tour of their essay's highlights. In the graduation speaker's college essay, this student challenged the belief or idea that the minor embarrassments of high school life really matter. He presents his main points using a mechanism, speech writing, presenting his case for letting go of the drama and focusing on the big picture at his imaginary high school commencement. The graduation speaker manages to do this with both wit and humility, coming straight out of the gate with a strong voice, an unmistakable sense of self, and a fearless commitment to the overarching device he's chosen. Some names in the following excerpt have been changed to protect the innocent and the guilty. The essay opens... Remember that one time, junior year, when you asked that girl out over text and she responded that she was really not interested in dating right now? And then she told her friends all about your proposal and they laughed and laughed? And the following Saturday night, you saw her at the movies with Stuart Schwartz while you were there with your mom? Remember that? Yeah, me neither. Now think of the time you tried out for the musical, even though Mike Ventura is a much better singer, and you got a lead role right alongside him, and hundreds of people came to watch you both shine on stage. Remember that? We all do. You see, the little stuff, the gossip, the grudges, the Twitter insults, the rejected dates with random girls, all of those things really do not matter. In this moment, we remember other things. We remember the times we took chances and did something big. So many elements of this essay immediately capture the imagination, but let's start with the opening line. Remember that one time junior year when you asked that girl out over text and she responded that she was really not interested in dating right now? Oh my God, do you remember that? Even though you weren't there, aren't you already invested in the graduation speaker's story after he asks you that question? He continues to set the scene for this embarrassing moment with humor and immediately shows the reader that he has perspective and the ability to find the good in any situation. By the time the graduation speaker wraps up his essay, the reader is on his or her feet, taking part in an imaginary standing ovation. When we see each other at our reunions five and 10 and 20 years from now, I know we will talk about our research grants, the books we are writing, the kids we are teaching, and the people we are helping at our nursing jobs. We will talk about our children and our friends and the way we have impacted the lives of other people. The many small blips on the road to our success will melt away. Remaining will be the things of real value. Those are the things we will share. Don't you immediately want to hang out with this person? We do. Another applicant who instantly connects to her readers is the Nike Jordans. Using dialogue as a main component in setting up her opening scene, she opens her essay introducing the idea that maybe, just maybe, people in America have some misconceptions about her home country of Senegal. The first time I was really puzzled by a question about my African origins, I was shopping in a mall in Maryland. One of the sales clerks complimented me on my sneakers, asking me where I got them. I told her that I bought them overseas in my country, Senegal. They have Nike Jordans in Africa, she asked me. She was surprised that I would be able to purchase the same products in Africa that are available in America. 
The Nike Jordans goes on to recount various examples of the same kind of misunderstanding and miscommunication, relaying her own shock and awe as various Americans she meets during a gap year in Washington, D.C. confirm her suspicions that her culture and upbringing are grossly misunderstood by the average American, defined by an array of disturbing cliches. Her reaction was not the last strange comment or inaccurate assumption I encountered during my adventures abroad. In a restaurant in Washington, D.C., I was waiting for my order when I revealed to the waitress that I was from Africa. She exclaimed, Really? That's so cool! When I was younger, The Lion King was my favorite movie. One man in Florida asked me how I managed to travel to the States, taking on an embarrassed shade of beet red after I said, A plane. And an old lady shared her regret of never experiencing a safari and was dumbfounded that I myself had never seen a giraffe or any other exotic animals. I live in a bustling metropolis. The comments and questions that came up most often were regarding my language and manner of speaking. Some people seemed surprised that I did not have an accent, considering it was my first time in the U.S. Others were just puzzled that I spoke French instead of African. Still, the Nike Jordan's response to these bizarre encounters is not one of anger or frustration, but one of hope and understanding. In fact, it motivates her to become a proactive force of change in bridging the gap between these cultures. While some people would have been offended by such questions and comments, I believe this dialogue is proof of a communication and knowledge gap rather than general insensitivity. Each bizarre inquiry and assumption taught me more about the deeply ingrained beliefs and false perceptions people have about my country. Beliefs I can help adjust. She closes with a line that showcases perspective, maturity, and grace, and leaves the reader with food for thought. The more proactively curious we are about other people's backgrounds, the more informed and open-minded we become. Along the way, the most valuable thing we can do is show understanding for each other as we stumble along the road to world knowledge and cultural sensitivity. After all, who among us already knows it all? An expertly executed ending, to say the least. In the Donut Eating Runner's essay, a runner, eats donuts. My mind wanders to a moment earlier in the month when, as I am ready to depart for an early morning run, my mother walks in the door with a box of donuts. Custard or sweat? At the time, I chose custard. How could I have been so stupid? In addition to indulging in one of nature's greatest available food items, the donut-eating runner also runs a marathon for charity and recounts this process in hilarious and endearing detail. On the morning of the big run, I woke up at 4 a.m. to board the bus to the race. I chatted with my friend Gabe, who hurt his knee a couple days earlier, and admitted to him that I had the jitters. At least you have both your legs, he quipped. By the beginning of the race, my nerves were calm, and when the starting bell rang, I felt energized. After crossing the course's first bridge, I approached the sign plastered with a large number 10. I couldn't believe I had already been running for 10 miles. But as I got closer to the sign, a small K came into focus. I hadn't been running for 10 miles. I had been running for 10 kilometers. Damn those Europeans. Our legs hurt just reading this. And that is what a good essay does. It pulls you into the moment custard first and propels you through the action via compelling details, savvy observations, and real human moments. One of the most intimate and thoughtful essays we've ever read comes from someone we're calling What Makes a Woman, who wrote about her experience of being acutely aware of her body's development right around the time her mother was diagnosed with breast cancer. She opens with the line, Through my 13-year-old eyes, maturity was proportionate to cup size, and quickly moves on to show the concurrent developments in her teenage life and the life of her mother. This is an incredible example of how students can write about people that inspire them and who have had great effect on their lives, while still revealing an ocean's worth of information about themselves. Take this excerpt towards the end of What Makes a Woman's Essay. As her treatments continued, we found out that my mom would need to undergo a double mastectomy. She recognized that the physical transformation of her body was going to be drastic and that it would take some getting used to, but she also reassured me that nothing fundamental about her would change. This contradicted what I had come to believe that the development of one's body was the primary indicator of true womanhood. 
In the weeks that followed my mom's surgery, I came to understand that a woman is not defined by her physical traits. Seeing mom wear shirts that showed off her flat chest, I could tell that she was proud of herself for surviving cancer, and more importantly, had embraced her life-changing experience. I was incredibly proud of her, too. She continues her exploration of what it means to gain a symbol of womanhood while her mother gives one up and how this affects her worldview. At 17, I have a new understanding of what it means to be a woman. While womanhood and adulthood can be hard to define, they are states characterized by far more than one's anatomy. Being a woman means making independent decisions and being confident in oneself. Being a woman is about understanding one's strengths and weaknesses and recognizing the uphill battle one may face in a less-than-perfect world. Being a woman means not letting someone else define womanhood for you. We know. Catch your breath. Wipe your tears. She's amazing. Who wouldn't want to have this young woman on their campus? Another one of our favorite essays featuring a mother-daughter relationship comes from In the Car with Mom, an applicant who reflects on what an average daily activity like a routine car ride means for her family connections and personal growth. In the Car opens her essay with a hearty string of dialogue, effectively setting the scene and revealing a lot about the characters in the process. What did you dream about last night? Mom asks me. It is 5.25 a.m. and my mother is still in her pajamas, huddled in a big sweatshirt to combat the winter cold. She is barely awake, and though I am only slightly more alive, as we sit next to each other in the car, we feel a desire to engage. I was sliding down a laundry chute, I tell her, dodging these crazy obstacles to get to the end and see what was waiting for me. We sit together in silence for a moment. What did you dream about, I ask in return. I was driving around with Prince Harry and Prince William, taking them for a sightseeing tour of New York. I have no idea why. I was probably thinking I had to get up to drive you. See, you are a born chauffeur, I tease. The applicant goes on to explore what this time in the car with her mother each morning meant to her, what it taught her, and what she realized when it inevitably came to a close. She writes, In 2013, I passed my road test and my whole routine changed. Communal conversation became personal reflection. Now, after practice, I run through vocabulary words in my head alone without a motherly prompt. I contemplate my future without side opinions. Most recently, I find myself thinking through my college options all without my trusty sounding board in the driver's seat. Though her commentary comes less frequently and later in the day, I still know she will always tell me exactly what she thinks. There are moments when I feel lost without her in the morning. Then I realized participating in those morning car rides was the ultimate form of preparation. Now, I belong in the driver's seat. In a bit of a departure from these emotional analyses, the burglar fighter brings you, well, a burglary. In fact, she gives you a front row seat to the action as it unfolds. I was sleeping when the burglar broke into my house. His footsteps were incorporated into my dream, clomping to the rhythm as I ran around an imaginary baseball field. My little sister shook me awake after the house alarm had been roaring for about a minute. My parents were already at work. I shot out of bed and reached for my glasses before leaving my room still clad in my sleepwear. I barely took two steps out of the bedroom when I spotted him at the top of the stairs just 15 feet from where I stood. You're inside the house with the applicant. Dear God, you have just spotted a stranger in the house. If you're the applicant, your natural response is, Who is this guy, I thought? He's wearing his shoes in the house. Try not to laugh at the randomness of that thought. Attempt to extract the crazy calm of the burglar fighter's demeanor from your mind. You can't, because she has you hooked. A few paragraphs later, she continues. The first question people ask me when I tell them this story is, were you scared? I have been both surprised and reassured to find in retrospect that I truly was not afraid. From the moment I laid eyes on my dark-clad intruder, more than anything, I felt prepared to defend myself. Then, the burglar fighter details her experience with judo, jiu-jitsu, and mixed martial arts, kicking the timeline back to when she was eight years old. 
She tells you how she got to be the kind of teenager who can truly kick butt when necessary and who is self-assured and measured enough in her responses to tackle any challenge that is thrown at her. Spoiler alert, the burglar runs away and no violence is necessary despite a brave encounter. Still, this is a black belt admissions officers want at their school, and not just for security purposes. Our last essay excerpt comes from The Nature Painter, who uses his essay to showcase his love of science and nature by explaining the importance of having the right tools, both as humans and in nature at large. Scientists say providing an animal with access to tools can profoundly influence its future behavior. Without meerkats bringing scorpions to their young, their pups would never learn to kill their dangerous yet necessary food. But even when animals are born with instinct, sometimes nature relies on something, or someone, else to provide crucial tools and demonstrate their intended uses. Does that sound like the beginning of a science paper? Totally. Just another what am I reading and why am I reading it tactic that pulls in a reader from the very first line. This opening paragraph about meerkats, so cute, and scorpions, not so cute, is also a clever metaphorical setup for the nature painter's exploration of his love of science and his passion for art, each of which was developed due to exposure and conditioning by his uncle and mother, respectively. Uncle Andy was the first to bring me the tools and teachings of nature. When I was little, I followed him around my backyard, exploring and looking under rocks. For my fifth birthday, he hosted a bug party for my friends and me, arming us with butterfly nets and serving drinks over ice with plastic crickets frozen inside. Nature brought us together. It is how we bonded. The tools of nature were further enhanced when my mother introduced paintbrushes, enriching my life with artful tools and creative thinking. From stamping to plaster, my mom walked me through her tools of expression, and I participated and mimicked. On family vacations, I pack watercolors, and together we head into the woods to capture wildlife-rich scenes on paper. Because of my experience, art and nature are synonymous. The applicant moves on to discuss how these interests overlapped in a project he created to save local endangered species through the sale of hand-painted greeting cards. He explains his motivation to kick off the project, coming back to his vivid animal world comparisons. Just as peacocks display their vivid tail feathers to attract attention, I instinctively wanted to use art to draw attention to an important cause, sustaining populations of threatened animals. And after summarizing the impact of his philanthropic efforts, the nature painter returns to the grand metaphor he sets up in his opening paragraph, reflecting on what these events and passions might mean for his future. Though I will leave the scorpion gathering to the meerkats, I will continue to be a person who introduces others to paintbrushes and crickets frozen in ice in the hopes of inspiring exploration and encouraging human curiosity, one of nature's greatest wonders. Now, that should be enough as a realness for the time being. Hopefully you have a clearer idea of how the tools we have given you in earlier chapters have been applied in practice and are already mixing up your own secret formula for success. We know it might be tempting to go in search of more sweet samples, but remember, the sugar crush and foggy brain that come after an overdose of other applicants' work isn't worth it. Trust that you have enough of your own Wonka magic and imagination to cook up a winning essay that has its own distinct flavor, sweetness, and enchantment. Now give your mental Oompa Loompas a break, pop an everlasting gobstopper, and kick your heels up on a boat ride through a river of chocolate. You're almost at the finish line.